time for reflection. So far, we have developed three console testers, console tester one, console tester two, focusing on two aspects for ass uh, assessing the correctness of the count uh, for the counter uh, solution. So remember test case number one, console tester number one. That one there actually makes sure when you try to decrement the value of the counter from minimum value, you should really get the uh, value to small exception as expected. And for console tester two, you're going to increment the value of the uh, counter three times all the way to its maximum. Over the course of doing that, you should not get any premature uh, value to large exception thrown. And also when you try to do the fourth increment, you definitely are going to get the value to large exception. So those are the two aspects that we showed to you uh, in the earlier uh, part of the module. So here's the question. If you consider the test cases one and two alone, are they sufficient for testing the counter's correctness? Can you actually claim? It's a, in other words, is it plausible to claim that the implementation of the counter is correct just because you pass console test one and console test two? Intuitively, it should be no, because I'm pretty sure you can think about other, at least uh, some other test cases that will actually need to be tested. For example, we haven't really tested to make sure if you actually, uh, if you increment the counter value, let's say one time and two times, go from zero to one, one and two, and the final value of that should be exactly two. And there should be no premature throwing of the uh, value to small or value to large exception beforehand, right? We haven't done that uh, that particular test case, for example. So we definitely cannot claim that test case number one and two that we did earlier are enough uh, for, for us to claim that the code is actually correct. But now the question is, how many more test cases do we really need? That's really the question. So I think uh, before I show you the uh, actual answer, I would like to show you the derivation process of test cases, especially for the counter problem. Uh, the nice nice thing about it is it's really simple enough and also by, by the fact that it's actually bounded, meaning that it got a minimum value, it also got a maximum value that we have to be constrained into. I think that can give us some uh, scope to really do some thorough testing. But I think uh, in realistically, of course, the input size uh, of your program might be very large. In that case, you don't necessarily have to really test for every input value, but you have to test the input value of different natures. So that one is really up to some uh, experience, but you can definitely chat with me if you want to explore further. But at least for the bounded variable over here, we can definitely do uh, some uh, thorough testing. Let's get some idea and you can apply that uh, for your uh, testing purpose for your laboratory exercises or for your programming test. Okay, let's now think about how many test cases can we really derive for the bounded counter. Always, you should really ask yourself, what's really the boundary for my variable? Let's say we got only got one variable. So in that case, we know the boundary is the C dot value or C dot get value for the counter. It should be between the minimum and also the maximum inclusive, right? So that means at the runtime, we set there are four different states for the counter, either when its value is equal to zero or equal to one or equal to two or equal to three, right? And then we uh, it's, it's so-called a state transition diagram. For those of you who might be taking 2001, EECS 2001, Introduction to Theory of Computation, you will learn about how to draw uh, like a so-called finite uh, automata. So it's like a finite state machine. But if you're if you're from the engineering side, you're not really doing this, uh, this, this course. That's okay. I just want to give you some intuition about how you can draw state transition diagram to derive the test cases. Okay. Okay, we got four different states, but now what's really lacking is how can we uh, do transition between one state to another, right? In our case, it's pretty simple. You can think about every possible transition is defined by the mutator method. Remember, mutator method is really meant to uh, modify the value for attributes. So if you go to, let's say, under uh, implementation over here, go back to the counter, and let's go to outline view. You can see how many mutators do we have in the counter class? Only two, increments or decrements. So these are the only two. And the principle is you may try to invoke either of these two methods in every state. And then you got to think about for every invocation of that method in a particular state, what the consequence should be. So that's the principle, okay? Let's now go back to here. So let me just try to have this following convention. For C dot increments, I'm going to use a green arrow. For the C dot decrements, I'm going to use the red arrow. Let's see, okay? So when can we do increments? We can do increments from zero to one, 
when c dot value is equal to zero when c dot value is one we can also do increments to go from one to two and also from two to three and also from three over here we will expect the value to stay the same but of course we'll expect some value too large exception to be thrown but these uh, these one, two, three, four, these one, two, three, four are the transitions made by increments. Okay, so there'll be increments over here. Let me write it down. Increments, 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 and also increments. Okay, what about uh, the, uh, the other way? What about decrements? When the value is actually equal to zero, I can definitely try to do decrements, but I wouldn't expect the value to be changed. So it should really stay the same. So that will be the decrements. Of course, I will expect the uh, value to small exception to be thrown. And of course, for increments, when uh, value is equal already reaching its maximum, I will expect the value to large exception to be thrown. Okay. And what can we do further? And we can definitely try the decrements when value is equal to one, from one to zero. So that'll be decrements. Or from two to one, that's another occasion. And also we can do from three to two, right? it's not possible to go from four to three because it's not even allowed to actually increment from three to four in the first place. So that's why we don't have the transition. You might be wondering, what about get value? You can see over here, we also got the uh, accessor method get value. In principle, you should really make your uh, accessor method set effect free, meaning that you should not really modify the attribute value. So you can still put it into context. Let me do that. Okay, I got red and green. What about I have a blue over here? Let's say I just got another method, uh, another arrow over here of blue. So that would be C dot get value, which means to inquire the value of the counter currently. I can definitely try to inquire the value for the counter when it is equal to zero, when it is equal to one, when it is equal to two, when it is equal to three. I can definitely do that. But let's now focus more on the mutator methods. They are the important ones to make sure you cover all the possible scenarios. So, so far, what have, what have we covered, right? So we talk about console test number one. For console test number one, we were, we were basically testing for this particular scenario. Let me use orange. So this was console tester one. You can verify that. So this will be console tester one, where we try to decrement the value when the value is actually zero. Value shouldn't change, but we should really get the value to small exception. Right. What about console tested two from the earlier part of the module? Console tested two, on the other hand, is testing for when you try to increment the value when it's already too large. Right. So that's console tested two. Let me write it down. So this will be console tester two. Right. And also we are expecting to see some value to large exception. And how many test cases are we missing? Well, let me highlight them in yellow. What's really missing is really number one, when you try to increment when value is zero. Number two, when you try to increment when value is one, when you try to increment when value is actually two. And decrements when the value is three, decrements when value is two, and decrements when value is zero. Right? How many test cases are we missing? One, two, three, four, five, six. Eight in total, but we have only covered two. So that's why we just cannot claim that our counter has been working perfectly. That's about the derivation for a single bounded variable, right? So, uh, of course, realistically, you might have to test for many variables in your class, but I'm just saying, uh, you, normally one class, uh, one test method in J units should only test for one particular aspect for your uh, class. In that case, you may just want to restrict to as, uh, as few variables as possible. That's something I want you to maybe think about it and when you uh, try to do your test cases. But hopefully this strategy over here makes sense to you. All right, let's now go back to the slots. Well, that's just a summary of all the eight test cases you should really get, right? So one, two, three, value too large, value too small, zero, one, two, right? We got eight test cases in total. We have already covered in console test number one, this test case, Covering console tester two, uh, this case. Okay, but what about the other six? Well, that'll be for your exercise to develop them. Okay, so in total we need eight test cases and six more separate ones for, for you to develop. Okay, 
and console tester classes to create. Uh, for each one of them, you will just have to create maybe console tester three, console tester four, all the way to console tester eight. Or you can still use the iterative console tester three with a loop, but you just have to make sure you cover all the eight different usage patterns to make sure every one of them is actually covered, uh, is actually uh, can be exhibited by the runtime behavior of your counter class, right? Either way, either you go for eight counter tester classes, or you go for eight different scenarios for the loop iterative console tester, either way, it's gonna be so manual and so tedious. So that's why, is there any problem you can see? The problem really is, it's so inconvenient and so error prone. Every time you have to do something manually, when it gets to large scales, it will definitely be uh, very easy for you to make a mistake. We are just humans. We are definitely uh, more uh, inclined to actually make mistake when we are doing something that's uh, routine and tedious. Okay, so if we just go for the console tester route, we have to run each test case by executing the main method of a console tester and compare the out console output with my uh, our eyes, right? That's something I actually verbally remarked uh, together with you earlier, okay? And then let's now think about this. Whenever the counter is changed, for example, if I go back to my uh, Eclipse over here, for whatever reason, if I decide to change the implementation for my increment method in whatever way, let's say I want to say rather than uh, rather than larger than, I can simply say maybe uh, larger than or equal to, right? Is that going to be okay, right? That's a valid question. The only way for me to find out is to execute all the console tester, in this case, console tester number one, console tester number two. Uh, let me go back to console tester. I gotta execute each one of them manually one by one to find out if they will, uh, they will actually generate any uh, error. Right? So every time there's any change to your software, you want to make sure you rerun all the test cases you have got so far. So the set of test cases you have define the notion about correctness of your class. It's really important principle to remember. Okay, let's go back to the slides over here. So rerun manually, maybe console test, well, let's say eventually you got all the eight console tester classes for your counter uh, problem here. Every time if there's a small change made to your counter, uh, class, you have to rerun one by one manually all the eight console tester, right? That's the, what I really meant to say. So that's about something called regression testing I want to uh, define over here. Regression testing simply means the following. Any change introduced to your software, no matter how small it is, must not compromise its established correctness. And when I say established correctness, it is defined by all the test cases you have got so far. In this case, if you can get all the te eight test cases written up, that will be very complete. In your lab, for example, you are normally given some starter test cases. Those starter ca test cases define some basic notion about correctness, but you're also expected to write your own test cases to make sure you, you can be at, uh, you can really increase the confidence level about the correctness of your software, right? But anyway, the important point is, Whenever you introduce any change to your software, you must make sure you rerun all the test cases you got you have got so far. You may have got 10 console testers so far. In that case, you're gonna run over them one by one. You may got a hundred test cases so far, meaning that you got a hundred console tester classes. In that case, you also have to run them one by one. It's so manual and it is so inconvenient, it is so error prone. Right? That's a really the main point I want to want you to be convinced. Okay. All right, so that's about everything I want you uh, to know about console tester and also a little bit of strategy about deriving test cases for bounded variable. And we now we will now be ready to revisit about the topic of J units.